Good morning, big girls. Today we are continuing the theme of the week, which is our sleepers. Today is the quarterback and wide receiver position. Only guys getting picked at 110 or later. Our favorite 110 or later picks in fantasy football drafts this year. Just quarterback and tight ends for today. If you've missed Tuesday and Wednesday's video, which was the running back and the wide receiver versions of this, make sure you go watch them things. All right, we'll link them down below for you. While we're down below there, let's tuck it in. And if at any point you just want all these players, you want all the lists, you want all the sleepers, you can get that in our draft guide, which is available for discounted pre-order price right now on BDGE.co. Or the cheapest way to get it is by depositing on Underdog Fantasy using promo code BDGE. $10 will get you deposit bonuses plus the draft guide absolutely free. That is the cheapest way to get it. That is the best way to support our brand. The best way to support your fantasy team is by taking Matthew Stafford as your quarterback this year. He's currently going off the board as the 19th quarterback. Pick 132. I've said this quite a few times, but he played 15 games last year. Had you paced him out for a full 17-game season, he is five yards short of leading the NFL in passing yards. I think most people view the Rams last year as a team that just got lucky, that far outperformed where they should have, right? Which is true to an extent, but they outperformed where they should have, not because of luck, but because of the expectations we had on their offensive line, their weapons, the health of these players. Uh, they were just better. They are they are better than what we expected them to be. Things didn't just break right for them. Like Stafford can still fucking sling the rock ski, all right? And his PFF passing grade last year was the single best grade of his entire 15-year career. 2023 was his best graded year, right? His four best graded years, 2023, 2021, 2020, 2019. He has just gotten better as he's gotten older, right? And now he has two outstanding weapons in Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. And as I said in the wide receiver version of this video, Demarcus Robinson, that's my man's right there. He is a legit wide receiver three. He now has a legit run game behind him with Kyron Williams. And their offensive line has, you know, uh, adapted and developed into a line that is a million times better than we anticipated going into last year. They were one of the highest graded lines per PFF. And when I think about the other side of the ball defense with Aaron Donald retiring, there might be a lot of points given up on that side of the ball, meaning they're going to have to sling the ball. All right. Last year, he was a top 14 fantasy quarterback in points per game without a fully healthy Cooper Cup all year. And Kyron Williams taking like 8,000 goal line carries. All right. So if a few more of those touchdowns skew towards Matt Stafford, he could be in for a monster season. So him going at quarterback 19, despite playing 15 games last year, like, sure, he might miss some games this year. He's old and he's banged up and he's bruised. But his supporting cast is about as good as it's been with Sean McVay. Love him in the offense. Uh, the points per game are going to be there. So he is probably my favorite sleeper based on the value you're getting him at at the quarterback position, followed closely by Deshaun Watson. He is the 146th player off the board, quarterback 22. The fact of the matter is this. Deshaun Watson is probably just bad at football at this point. Uh, there's just been too much of the off-the-field stuff that has transferred onto the field and you could see it. He is shaky. He is skittish. He is unsure. He is unconfident. And uh, it's obviously affecting his play, but he can still move. He is still mobile. He is still young. He is still very athletic. He played in six games last year. Uh, one of the games, week seven, he played about four snaps. So we're going to discount that from the stats. In the five games that he really played last year, most of which he was really banged up for, he averaged over 28 rushing yards per game and over four carries per game. He also threw for fewer than 210 yards just one time. Didn't have a single multi-interception game. The problem was he just never really had a ceiling game. But if you look at year one back from the off-the-field stuff to year two, he did improve. His passing yards per game went up by 40 yards. Passing touchdowns per game went up. Interceptions per game went down. His fantasy points per game went up by two points per game. Okay. And again, he did all of this while basically being broken. He was a fractured skeleton with all those injuries. You know, hopefully he's healthy going into this year. You look at the weapons around him, they're at worst above average and, and probably higher than that. Amari Cooper is a real one. They signed Judy to 70 million for whatever the fuck that means to you. I think he's a cone, but it is what it is. Elijah Moore, uh, David Njoku, Jerome Ford out of the backfield. The offensive line last year was destroyed, just decimated by injuries. But when they're healthy, they are a top five offensive line 
unit in the NFL, and we will have those types of numbers in our draft guide as well. Okay, so offensive line, offensive pace, fantasy playoff uh, ease of schedule, any of those like tiebreaker things that we think will help you while you're on the clock. We have uh, a really cool tiebreaker tool matrix coming out for you guys in the draft guide bdg.co but trust me i hate this pick as much as you do uh but here we are i genuinely think at quarterback 22 he's one of the better values in all of fantasy football because if he takes a slight step up again right 2022 15 points per game 2023 17 points per game if he jumps up again a little bit has a little bit more consistency the offensive line doesn't get hurt goes up to 19 points per game you're looking at a really really solid like low-end quarterback one will he ever recapture who he was unlikely but i still think he could be extremely useful in fantasy football and he shouldn't be going like undrafted unusable he's like one of my favorite quarterback two threes to draft in underdog drafts right now the rest of the sleepers i I think i'll probably go more in on them in the breakout version of this video where i think they have a little bit more upside and they're a little bit more valuable so we'll kind of switch speeds and go over to the tight end position and the first guy up on this list, right, my my criteria for getting onto this list was that you had to be at pick 110 or later. And this man's is the 110th pick overall in drafts. And that is Dallas Goddard of the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, this passing offense has kind of just been discounted, I feel like, overall because of how the second half of the year played out. And it should be. But I like Kellen Moore coming in as their offensive coordinator. He is a very fast-paced offense coordinator. They're going to run a lot of plays. They're going to throw the ball a lot. And they used the tight end a lot in L.A. last year when Kellen Moore was the O.C. They obviously used the, the tight end a ton in Dallas when he was the O.C. Like every single year. Didn't matter if it was Jake Ferguson or Dalton Schultz or whoever was the tight end in Dallas when Kellen Moore was there ended up being a top 10 or 12 fantasy tight end. All right. I think the hate on Dallas Goddard has just gone too far. He's been really, really solid yardage wise, basically his entire career. Motherfucker can't score touchdowns. So, OK, when I'm looking back at like what are the benchmarks that he needs to hit to be like the tight end, you know, eight or ish. That's what you're looking for. When you draft in tight end 12, you're hoping he can give you like top eight upside. And I went back over the last eight years. The tight end who had the eighth most receiving yards each year on average, has around 698 yards. Last year, Goddard was on pace for 718. In 2022, he had 702 in just 12 games. He had 830 the year prior in just 15 games. So again, like the yardage, the production, the involvement is never a concern, except, except, except down by the end zone and the red zone. I like Goddard a thousand times more in PPR leagues than I do in standard or half PPR because he's just not really a part of their game plan when they get near the end zone. It is the tush push. They're going to use Saquon. They use AJ Brown. Like Goddard's never really been a dude that they they talk about it all summer about how he's going to be a huge red zone weapon. But last year he got three end zone targets. In 2022, he got two. In 2021, he got two. There's no unluckiness going on there. They just don't use him in that part of the game plan. So if he's not going to be a high-end touchdown producer, you can't rely on him to be a standard or half PPR standout. But in full PPR, I think you could be looking at like a discount version of, ah, dare I say, Evan Ingram, but in that vein where he could be a high volume player that ends up with 800 receiving yards, 65, 70 catches, and you feel pretty good looking back on it by the end of the year. So I think the hate on Dallas Goddard has gone too far. You want to talk about a dude who could not score touchdowns. Hear me out on this one. Hear me out. I haven't heard a good case for this guy pretty much ever, but I'm hopefully about to make it for you. Tyler Conklin of the New York Jets. I could see Tyler Conklin being a legitimate red zone weapon for Aaron Rodgers this year. Conklin has weirdly had 80, exactly 87 targets in three straight seasons, catching 61, 58, and 61 passes. Over the last three seasons, there have only been four tight ends that have had at least 58 catches in all three seasons. Travis Kelsey, TJ Hawkinson, George Kittle, and Tyler Conklin. Last year, Tyler Conklin ranked fifth in slot snaps amongst the tight end position, ninth in total routes run, ninth in air yards, sixth in deep targets. He just needs to score some touchdowns. And with Aaron Rodgers as the quarterback, his touchdown a higher lower on underdog right now is 27 and a half. That's way too high for me, but that's what Vegas is saying. So they're expecting Aaron Rodgers to throw a lot of touchdowns. And Tyler Conklin is the tight end there. He is clearly the starting tight end there. He hasn't scored a touchdown in 26 games. Tyler Conklin hasn't scored a touchdown in 26 games. What are we doing here? If you add, right, I I said he's one of four. He's one of four tight ends that have had at least 58 catches in each of the last three seasons. If you were to add 
three to four touchdowns to any of his previous three seasons, he is a tight end one. He is a tight end one in fantasy. Not a high upside, not exciting one, but at the end of the season, the points will be there. Behind Garrett Wilson, there's fucking nothing on this depth chart. They added Mike Williams, who's an old receiver that relies on being able to get up and go get jump balls, who's coming off of a late season ACL tear. I got no confidence that he's going to be healthy or be able to stay fully healthy for the entire season. So there's nobody else down by the red zone besides Garrett Wilson in the passing game, like beyond the line of scrimmage. So Tyler Conklin, if he just produces the way that he's been producing in one of the worst fucking passing offenses of the last half decade in the same vein, but he adds three, four, five, dare I say like six or seven touchdowns, he's going to back his way into being a low end tight end one, if not like the tight end seven or eight with some of these touchdown numbers. All right. So Tyler Conklin, I think he just flies under the radar because he's so boring. He doesn't score touchdowns, but his production has been on par with like most low end tight end one. So keep your eye open for Tyler Conklin. Start drafting him in the later rounds of underdog best ball drafts in that same vein, actually uh, literally the opposite vein, but same kind of tier when we're talking about touchdowns, Hunter Henry. I, I like drafting him at the end of rounds. The Pats scored, he's getting picked like 162 right now, 165. The Pats scored 16 passing touchdowns last year. Henry had six of them, six of 16, 37.5%. In 2021, Mac Jones's rookie year when he had like a good year and the team threw 24 passing touchdowns, Henry had nine of them, nine of 24. 37.5% again. He is just a very, very solid red zone target for them. And again, I, I, I think this is just something you're going to hear me say throughout the entire summer. We have to leave room for these teams in full like swap energy rebuild mode. Drake May, new coaching staff, new weapons. We have to leave room for them to be better than we are projecting them to be. And if they are, and this team is not like the worst team offense in the NFL, Henry's probably going to score another handful of touchdowns, five, six, seven touchdowns, and be one of Drake May's favorite top red zone targets, okay? So keep an eye on Hunter Henry. He's a touchdown machine in a fucking malnutritious offense, all right? So Hunter Henry, and the last guy up on this list, we've got Noah Fant. I know, uh, you know, Big Adam over here at BDG has been kind of uh, running his mouth about Noah Fant all summer. So he's finally got me on board. And I've talked about him a little bit and his ADP and underdog is starting to spike and probably because we're making so many fucking videos about him. But when I look at Seattle, they bring in Shane Waldron to call the plays and run the offense. This is going to be a very new offense out there in Seattle. It will not be run first. It will be very pass heavy. They will drop back and, and slang the ball quite a bit and without any sort of pressure on Noah Fant he should be open quite a bit and they've got rid of basically every single tight end that they had in the depth chart that had been soaking up random targets you know the Will Disleys of the world like those types none of them are on the Seattle roster anymore Noah Fant is the one that got extended so he is continuously on the uh, on the roster and they paid him money to be the starting tight end there he is that high upside breakout like what David Njoku did last year probably because of lack of weapons but he's the same guy where he's not like a phenomenal football player but if you get the ball in his hands, he can make plays. And when I look at what this offense could be, last year I went I went back and looked at like the, the Washington offense, just like pass to run ratio. They threw the ball over 38 times per game. And it probably was only limited to that because they kept beating the shit out of like the University of Washington was obviously awesome last year. They kept beating the shit out of opponents. So there was a ton of games where the whole second half was just running out the clock and running the ball. So they were probably going to throw the ball 40, 41, 43 times per game. I, again, I think a lot of that's going to go into this offense and you know no offense probably the fourth option in this, in this passing offense but at pick 200 a guy that has unbelievable athleticism and speed and breakaway speed we've seen him you know he's never really put it together for a full season I think he was maybe the tight end 10 actually uh, a few years ago but we've seen throughout the years even in his bad years there's like one or two plays a year where you get no offense in space and he ends up running for like a 70 yard touchdown if they give him more opportunities there's going to be more plays like that all right, so Noah Fant getting the extension, becoming the starter, getting all the fucking fodder out of the way of the depth chart, and him being the dude that's probably going to play 80% of the snaps now, I expect there to be big games out of him, all right? So Noah Fant, he's the last guy up on this list that I think we should stop sleeping on, all right? Quarterbacks, tight ends, I know they're not exciting, but we got to do it. We got to show love to everybody. And if you want to show love to us, you could do that by subscribing. You could do that by going to cop the draft guide, bdge.co, or the cheapest way, least expensive way, underdog fantasy, promo code BDGE. When you deposit $10 or more, that'll get you a bunch of deposit bonuses on underdog to draft with us to take those higher lowers, and it'll get you the draft guide for free when it launches on August 1st. Okay, I'm out of here. Have a fucking phenomenal weekend. We've got the live trivia event tomorrow morning. 
Uh, so I'm probably deep in prep for that right now. If you're in the tri-state area, last second ticket purchases, we probably still got a couple available up on BGE.shop if you want to meet the boys. If not, it's okay. Keep watching, keep yapping, keep sharing, keep commenting. I love you. Smoochies. Thank you.